Hi, my name is Kiki Korshatz. I'm the editor here at Goop. Welcome to Goop Book Club. We're so happy to have you. As you know, this is our, our, our October book club pick. Um, we are going to be talking with Sanjeev Zahoda, the author of China Room today, who we'll bring on in a second. Just a reminder, we are live. Sorry for any tech glitches. Also, apologies if you hear the construction going on outside my apartment window. Um, if you're new to Goop Book Club, you can always go to goop.com slash goopbookclub. We have all our info there, um, Q&As with our authors, excerpts from the book, um, other reading picks, and every month we have a members-only Zoom chat, and then I also come on here at the very end of the month and talk with our author. And at the end of today's chat, I will be sharing what we're reading next, so stay tuned. Um, so as I said, October, we've been reading China Room by Sanjeev Zahoda. This is a stunning book. It just surprised me and kept me compelled at, at every turn. And every time I kind of thought I figured out a character or a dynamic or what was going to happen next, I was surprised. It has two different storylines. Um, in 1999, a young man goes to Punjab to his uncle and aunt's house where he is hoping to get his way through an addiction. And he ends up at a farm where 70 years earlier, his great grandmother went um, when she was one of three brides, married three brothers and didn't know which brother it was. And both of their stories unfold from there. Um, so I am so excited to be talking to Sanjeev today. Sanjeev, thank you so much for being with us and please come on the screen. Hi. Hi, hi Kiki. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's so fun to have you. Thank you so much. Can you start by talking a little bit about the seed of where this this story came from for you? Yeah, sure. It was um, it was a long time um, coming, really. So I I'd always known of this story, this kind of this this piece of family legend or family lore um, that a a great grandmother of mine back in the kind of 20s, so pre-independence era, um, that she was married to one of four brothers, actually it's, it's three in the novel, but she was married to one of four brothers and um, in a single ceremony and that none of the brides knew which of the brothers was her husband until, so the story goes, a year later when they saw who was holding which child and i'm sure that story would have been embellished and exaggerated as as the years rolled by as as family stories um tend to be um but it was always spoken of at least in in each time i heard it with a degree of kind of levity and and humor as, as if you know in the way that we kind of we so often patronize um you know the people that lived that long ago um even you know even though it's not particularly that that long ago, it's only like you know that's less than a hundred years. Um, but it always sounded like quite a dark and painful story to me, and something that had just something quite mythic about it. These these women who were sequestered away in kind of the women's room, as as um, the women of that time um, sometimes and often often were, kind of and and it just resonated really. It just felt like a story that. I could look into the psychology of it was fascinating to me. I mean, the fact that it was a kind of a, a piece of family law, I suppose, was is intrinsic to how I connected the story. And the fact that the farm that all this, um, or that my great grandmother lived on, is still a farm um, in my family in India, a place where I go to and have and have and have lived. And the fact that, that room, the China room, still exists. So it's not called the China room. It's just it's a room. Um, where apparently where the women used to mostly um, stay. So because this piece of family law was, I suppose, the, the seed. And then it was a long time before I worked out the right way to kind of tell this story or whether even if it was if it was my story to tell. Did you always know that you would focus on, from, you know, this fictional great grandmother's perspective? Did you always know that you wanted to zone in on on her perspective and then how did you ultimately decide you were going to have these split narratives with this young man and more of the present day i guess although 1999 how did you kind of like come to that pick those as like two lenses into the story yeah i think um i started off with the historical strand and i wrote perhaps 10 
10,000, 15,000 words of that. And the, the kind of the, the more contemporary strand wasn't anywhere in my mind at that point. Um, but then the historical strand, as I said, I wrote about, uh, I wrote, you know, 10,000 words of it. And it just kind of just didn't feel like it was, it was alive on the page. Something just felt to be really missing. And I think it was the fact that I had no interest in writing a kind of a, a straight historical novel. The idea of that just kind of slightly bored me, if I'm honest. And so I set that aside. I thought, I don't really want to write an historical narrative starting in pre-partition India and, and writing some big kind of historical um, tome. So I set that aside. I just thought I'm done with that. And those those kinds of women and that fictional great grandmothers have to just stay as, as an unwritten story. And I started just trying to think about other narratives I wanted to tell. And then I started thinking about a narrative involving a more contemporary narrator, a kind of a, a almost a fictional version of, or a younger version of, of me. And as I was writing that kind of contemporary narrative, or trying to understand that contemporary narrator, um, um, I ended up going, um, having to move back into my parents' house because my, my father was convalescing after some surgery and he just needed some hand kind of getting back on his feet. Um, and then while I was, this was in 2019, the spring of 2019, and then while I was back at my parents' house, back where I'd not lived for you know, for 20 odd years, um, the photo of my great grandmother was there. And it kind of, I suppose it was quite a triggering event. It just made me, slowly it made me see that the story that I was trying to write with this contemporary narrator was in some senses a parallel to the story of this great grandmother, which I kind of given up writing that there were both characters in different ways and though I make no equivalence between the two there were both characters who are being oppressed by the society they're both characters searching for liberation they're connected by um, ideas of um, family and blood and also by place and it was only then that I kind of pulled out pulled out those 10,000 words that I'd kind of given up on and saw that these two strands were actually part of the or could be part of the same the same narrative and actually and the contemporary narrator gave me the lens through which I could actually tell the story of of that historical um of that historical um figure of, of that fictionalized great grandmother because I think one thing that was really bothering me was this question of authorship but what right did I have or what did anyone have to put words into the mouth of a a a person who really lived of it you know of a, of a and someone who has no right of reply you can't kind of say no you know mr great grandson you've got you know you that, that's not how it was and you can't say that and until and i think having this contemporary narrator and having raising this question of authorship about who is telling the story and why would they be telling the story kind of gave me my kind of reconciled or gave me a way to actually reconcile myself that it was okay for this contemporary narrator to be telling the story to be telling the story of his great grandmother as long as he acknowledged that the book acknowledged that that is what he was doing and he was aware of the, the pitfalls and the the compromises that are inherent in this kind of this retain the story of someone who really lived yeah and i think that comes out too especially with his exploration at the end where he feels like these things are kind of slipping away from him and he's wanting to know like what was the story of this great grandmother and i think either exactly. he says or there's other characters who say well you know who knows she's not here to say like it was this rumor or that rumor um, and I think it's true, you know, we do have these myths and these family lores. All of us, you know, have these stories that are passed down. And I think it's interesting when you said, like, you know, it was said with it with a funny way. Because I feel like that, too. Like, sometimes there's a family story where I'm like, oh, is that how the, the other person felt? You know, in that things yeah. have a way of, of building and growing. So I think that was true. And I think even something that came up for me like when you think about like the scope of this book it, it feels big but at the same time it was all of these small snapshots and I think flashbacks can be one of the trickiest things in fiction but I thought you did such a brilliant job of the the flashbacks with um uh, for, for instance when he's thinking about his father there's these moments that you see were so pivotal in his own life where he's kind of viewing what were the the hardships and the trauma that his father went through and how did those impact him. So I thought it was interesting how he had this way of looking at like his own past and then he would have ways of zooming into the future that kind of paralleled with him 
investigating his, his family's past as well. And I, I also feel like a lot of people can relate. There's that moment, I think it's on, it's on page 42 when he's back in his, his childhood home. And he says, I couldn't give my attention to comprehending someone else's world when I was for the first time in two decades and for the final time too, living in a place had once unraveled my own. And I think that is such a relatable moment, you know, when you, you go back to a place where you've grown up and it really does, it has this powerful, yeah, just like kind of reckoning over you. Yeah, it's ghosts, isn't it? It's the ghost kind of the past. And not just your own ghosts, but the ghosts of the people that went before you do tend to, can sometimes rise up and then make you question, I suppose, how did things end up? You know, you know, it's, it's kind of remarkable to me that I ended up as, as a writer in England, given, um, given you know, the family history and, and everything, all the big historical events that would have led, led me to kind of end, to finish up being a writer living in, in, in England and being a novelist. It's, and, and kind of the, the people and the, the things that would have happened that led to that are always sort of in my, in my mind. And they do this idea of the things that live on. I think one of the things the book is trying to consider is the way things live on, pain, the way pain kind of lives on. And so the pain of Meher, how that is, continues to be felt um, by her, by her great grandson, this idea of intergenerational trauma is, is one way I've, I've seen it spoken about. And also I think that links into, the, as I said, this idea of um, ghosts and memories kind of always being being around us. You know, that Faulknerian, you know, kind of quote, like the, the, you know, the past isn't over, it's not even past. And I think I do really believe that. I think it's useful for a novelist to believe that as well. <laughs> Yeah, I think the other thing to me that was so remarkable was, was the way that you interwove desire with these different emotions. Like, I think there's the one, the youngest brother, who there's the moment when he's having sex in there for the first time, and it's like this desire, like, interwoven with shame. And I thought the other thing that was really interesting was how you also gave Mehar, like, her own desire. And that was something to me that was so surprising, and I wasn't, I almost, like, was like felt disappointed in myself that I hadn't expected that but I thought the way that that came through and obviously she was limited in so many ways and there were so many aspects of her life that were controlled but the way that she really did have this agency and this intuition and this desire that I thought I don't know it just was a really remarkable edge that you kind of walked with that and how did you how did you kind of think about desire in in the scope of this story yeah, it kind of um I didn't I don't think I started the novel um with that in mind that I wanted to sort of show me her feeling desire. I know I wanted to show her as the novel progressed, growing in agency and having a greater sense of her own personhood and of her of her right to have choices, really. I wanted that to be, even though they're going to be limited and she won't even she won't be able to exercise those choices because of the times that she lives in and the subjugation that she has to live under i wanted her to certainly feel the right to have those choices and i think in the process of writing the novel and and given the fact that these the only time she comes into contact with her husband or the person she thinks is her husband is um is when she's summoned to do so at at night it kind of felt inevitable that that was going, you know, desire and and her her reaction to desire was going to be pivotal to how she thought about herself and her place in the world. Um, and once that happened, it became kind of clear to me that her right to feel desire was one of the ways I was going to show her right to her own personhood. Um, and I think it's there with all the, there's kind of like this, I mean, Meher is the main kind of um, protagonist and certainly the main um, woman in, in the book. But there are other women as well. And this question of desire is kind of like almost could be traced along a historical arc by using these women. So there's, there's Mai, who's Meher's mother-in-law, who um, is also, I think, you know, she, she's monstrous in many ways, but she's also subjugated by 
her times, but she's she's living in a time where there's no such idea of um, of a woman having her own personhood. And it's interesting how her ideas of desire curdle and the way she um, has, has to inhabit more of more masculine. Her ideas are more hyper masculine persona in order to even exist. And then from my there's Meher who is living in a time where there's a political movement around a leader to think of her right to feel her right to to have choices and options in life and then after that there's an aunt um in the more con in the more contemporary strand and how she's also um she's another one who's like su suffering at the hands of a of a brutally patriarchal society but she she's given more agency over her desire than Meher was and there's Radhika who's the doctor in the contemporary strand who the narrator has this kind of infatuation with and she's very much kind of like the at the end of that arc where she's very much someone who um doesn't listen to kind of like the gossip that surrounds her gossip has gossip has such currents and all but Radhika I love her because she does she she forges her own path and her right and her right the right to feel desire is something that Radhika feels very strongly so desire ended up being something that I wanted to trace um, um, by using these kind of these these or through these four women rather than using these four women. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the aunt too because that was something that was another twist for me that I thought was really interesting. And you have this there's this description of because she of course had been in love with with her neighbor. Is it Tandir or how do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah Tandir. Um, and there was this amazing line where you say something like, you know, Tanvir had been allowed to move on and to have these other loves and to, you know, seemingly from her perspective, let's say, like, forget and, and move on and who knows how he really felt. And it was like she was never she never had that opportunity right. to sort of like rebuff him or to say, like, from her perspective, like it was over and I chose to end it. Um, and I just thought that was such a yeah fascinating way of of putting it um that i didn't you know it kind of changed the way i thought about the aunt i guess yeah i really wanted that final scene where we see the aunt where actually for the first time he actually calls her cuckoo he doesn't call her aunt he actually gives her a name and individuates her in his own mind the narrator does which is a sign of him starting to grow up i think by the end of the the narrative as well um and yeah as i say she's 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 an, she she's another woman who's who suffered and she's not been allowed to sort of live the life she wants to and throughout the book she's she's she is i think painted as quite a a bitter and and an angry woman but in that final scene i think things do start to turn for her and i love there's this her final line where she's when the narrator asks her if she knew anything about the great grandmother when he looks at the room and she says all she says is um i say i knew the hut the hut where the um, the lovers used to meet she knows the lovers hut because obviously that used to be her hut in the past as always she used to meet her lover that 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 kind of that extension of sympathy from narrator to to the aunt and and the aunt rejecting it because she doesn't want sympathy she doesn't want pity she just wants to be able to exist i thought was really important for me that thing that's a really key scene i'm glad you picked up on that yeah and i think too just what I was reminded of as I was looking back at the book is how young the the male narrator is and then also how young Mahar is. And you sometimes yeah. forget that because especially with Mahar because I think she was she was so wise. Like she has these moments where, you know, she really she really kind of like pegs every character, but then at the same time she notices she has these feelings that maybe don't line up to her rational way but i felt like she was so smart and you sometimes forget that she was the youngest by so much and then you know the male narrator he has these moments of despair and optimism optimism and i love that line i think it's on um 166 where um he says and this is with radica she kissed my cheek and brushed past my arm and i watched her ba walk back to her side of the porch i felt a sharp longing for her and beside that longing faith that life need not remain a well of anger that it can also be full of beautiful moments that just seem to arrive with the birds and you know then he has these moments at the towards the end where it's like he's really like you know i'm gonna get through this addiction and then it's like we we get this this glimpse into the future of like well he'll get through it and then he'll slip again and then he'll get through it and that that kind of is the way that life goes but i think 
it was interesting that you chose these two young characters who are also trying to understand this family history and what what makes these people the way they are. So I thought also the the age and the wisdom and the years, like that was something I was really thinking about. I didn't think about as much the first time I read it, but when I was looking back, and I don't know, did you did you choose specifically, was that something you thought about when you were writing the characters or? Um, I mean, I was aware that they'd have their whole lives ahead of them, even at the end of the book. And I wanted to give, which is why I think towards the end of the book, it does kind of leap forward. And there's, there's like a flash forward, isn't there, where they, she, they talk about how, or the narrator talks about how things finished up for, not just for Meher, but for the, the two other sisters-in-law, the two other brides, and for my young four. There's kind of like this, there's this paragraph, there's kind of, there's kind of like a, a slow leave taking like it's almost like each character is just taking their bow at the end and you can like accept what you kind of realize what happened to them and how things end up and they leave the stage i did see it in that kind of especially when the, on the stage just it's just left with the horse at the end so it's kind of leave taking um so i did what i did want that sense of a possible future being foreshadowed for all of the characters in the historical narrative and for the narrator, I thought it was, I mean, it was just, it was just necessary that he was 18 when he went back because I suppose because it's, there are parallels with, with my life and I was 18 when I went to India and had quite a, a formative summer. It was pre-university. I suppose the summers before university are always, you know, reasonably formative, aren't they, I guess. Um, and yeah, these, these young lives with their whole kind of like world ahead of them, but even even though they have got their lives to come, something has happened in that early life which will always kind of live with them. And in Meredith's case, it kind of it's something that shapes the rest of her life um, completely. I think. But for the narrator, too, it's something. It's been you know, it's been that it's it's a, it's a summer of reckoning for both of them. And for the narrator, he comes, he gets through that summer, and but it. it it lives with him the pain of the pain of what he's been through in his adolescence stays with him throughout and as you say he, he gets to the end and he thinks it all it's all gonna be fine he's gonna go off into the world and have this bright future um but it you know it, it there's no again there's a small flash forward and you realize it doesn't quite work out that nicely and it was quite important for me to have that that fact that it doesn't and not everything works out quite nicely you know i didn't really want this to be a novel where a young man goes to India and finds himself, and everything's great afterwards. I wanted, I wanted a bit of, um, I just say, a bit of realism into the mix as well. That this is just a case of muddling through. You know, he'll, he'll continue on. Things will go. Some things will go well. Some things won't. And, and um, kind of, there is no complete redemption. The pain will always be there. I think is what uh, what I was trying to do at the end with these with these young lives. Yeah, and I think too how we have these moments in our past that are always going to inform who we are and shape us. Like with Radhika, for instance, like he finds out that what happened to her in her past and these mm -hmm. these moments where she was really wronged and how that kind of continues to shape her today. Um, I don't know. I also thought Jeet was so interesting to me. I mean, I think of like these other kind of you you might think of like periphery characters or even like Monty in the beginning, like his relationship with Mahar and these yeah. who felt so I love Monty. <laughs> I felt so bad for Monty that we didn't get to see him again. Yeah. I know that the line I have to tell you broke my heart. Like, you know, at the end where he's like, you know, that was the last time he would see his sister. And I thought like, I mean, that to me was a great example of, of something that was so developed in such a short amount of span. Because I think the first time we meet Monty, it really seems like, you know, he's not happy. He's not happy where where he's been placed in this family. And he's kind of like disgruntled and so quickly. And I think that often, I mean, their relationship was very specific. But I think sometimes with older brothers and younger sisters, that can be the case. You know, you have, there's the period of the relationship where like, we're not on the same page and by the end you saw how much tenderness yeah and protection had like developed um so yeah that one to me was like gut-wrenching and i kind of felt the same way about g2 because he he was a wonderfully developed character and i think 
I don't know, the, the restraint that he showed in and towards the end of the book was really remarkable. And did you ever, did you kind of know that's how his character would play out and that's how he would develop? Or did you ever think he would have more of sort of like a revenge streak in him? Um, I was always really mindful that, I, you know, I never want to write complete villains or complete heroes i think mine might be the closest i've got to writing a villain but i think even she's got kind of like um a history that doesn't excuse her behavior but perhaps enables us to under understand it but with no with with, with there's you know there's several triangles in the novel aren't there and i suppose the the jeet suraj meher triangle was one where i didn't want anyone to be i don't, I don't want anyone to say that i don't want any easy way out for my characters i want them to be to be complex and nuanced and contradictory. So Jeet, he absolutely he loves he you know he he's absolutely certain that he's at, he loves Mary and he loves her really dearly and tenderly. Um, I think, but equally he he's aware he loves his brother as well. And he's aware his brother's his brother Suraj has been shortchanged in in so many ways that he doesn't have the advantages that Jeet has been given by virtue of Jeet being the eldest in the house. And he's he's very aware of that too. And in a sense, he's he's quite forgiving of their um of their relationship as odd as that as, as odd as that sounds but also he wants he's very certain that his love for mary is is paramount and i wanted to really have all of those things in play and similar with meher and suraj i mean they love each other or they say they love each other but there's always a question in my mind and i think in the book's mind about how much of their love for the love for each other is is corrupted by you know meher's desire for freedom she says at one point that she's she's not she, she she's never sure that or she looks away because she wonders how much of her desire for Suraj is wrapped up in in the fact that Suraj is her vehicle for escape her vehicle for to get out of the china room and to lead a life where she does genuinely have control of her own destiny and Suraj too he says he loves Meher but how much is how much of his love for Meher is wrapped up in his his desire to kind of like as he said, to destroy the world, to break free of the tyrannies he feels he's been made to live under. Um, so there's all these ideas of this love triangle. It's a really odd one and complicated one. And their love for each other is, I think, is is corrupted partly because of the place that they're in. There's a question about, is it, is it even possible to love someone purely or cleanly, whatever that means, when you are living in a, a place of, of of subjugation and in a place of great um um of of harm or you're not given the kind of your your or your life has is, is not given the value that it deserves to be is love is kind of is love or that kind of like pure love i guess if it is is it even can it even exist and certainly i think between suraj and meher it's corrupted and i think with jeet as well there's in a sense jeet, jeet's love for meher is perhaps the most um clear i guess um though you know though terrible and sort of um and fraught in in many ways too yeah and i think too to go back to this idea of you know something i thought about while reading the book is like who's to judge what what is a pure love or what is a real love or what is yeah. um you know and i thought with Mary and Suraj, it's like on the one hand it's like they kind of were almost surprised i felt like they were almost surprised in a way to meet someone who like it was like you said that the, this like escape plan sort of came together between them and it was almost like for the first time they found someone who <laughs> they could envision a different type of future with. And I think on the one hand that like always is something that is gonna bring people together, this idea of you come together with another person and you're able to create this this future. And I think also underscores how important this sense of desire and agency in that like you are the one, like there's something inside of you that is like drawing you to this other person and just how powerful that can be not in a naive way, but like that really does shape our lives and the way we feel about the people that we're with. Yeah, it's interesting how the shape of their 
desire, Meher and Sura's desire, or at least this is what they tell themselves, it fits exactly the, sh the shape of, of, of the other person. So, and, um, and I'd say it's very, it's powerful. I mean, in Meher's case, it does, I think it blinds her to the danger that she's in. She doesn't actually see that, you know, everyone knows, everyone, everyone has figured out around her. As the reader, I think there's this huge dramatic irony, I think, that takes place where the reader is aware that, or at some point the reader becomes aware that Jeet knows, Mai knows, the sisters all know, but Meher, even though I think she knows on some level, because at one point in the book she does, she talks about um, not being able to look too hard at something because she can't bring herself to interrogate what it might reveal. And that is the fact that she can't look at what is actually the truth of what's happening around her. That that um, that she is in that she is in great peril. But the desire, her, her need for freedom, her, you know, and you know the very human need for freedom, which I think we all feel um, for her is is so strong. It just it just blots out any you know the the actual. Um, real difficulties that's that she's in and the danger that she's putting herself in and i think the same goes for suraj as well he again he's 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 not oblivious to the danger he's in but he he, he won't it's, it's almost if he won't allow himself to see it. he can't allow himself to see it because this the need for for liberation is is stronger yeah and i think we all have these you know compartmentalization games that we we play in our minds and i thought with Mahar that was really well done in the page because i think she had these moments where it was like i think maybe early on she says something to like suraj it's like um you know if if you had been married to me initially like you would have been doing this with girly and like she kind of has this moment where she's like yeah. she knows part of it for him right is just that like is this twist? Is this revenge? Is this escape? Um, but then I think we all so many times know like we're charting into dangerous territory, but we like shut down. We block out the warning signs a lot because it's something that we really want or feel that we want. So I thought yeah. that part was relatable. Yeah, I suppose the promise of of freedom or whatever it is you want is just it's just too tantalizing and too enticing to kind of look away from and you, she, you know she took a chance she took her chance and she hoped that it would you know she'd prevail and she'd you know that she'd get away and and it'd be okay you know and I think she's an extraordinarily brave and kind of courageous and strong-minded young woman as you say and wise too and she's got this kind of this quiet charisma about it which I really love um as does Radhika too Radhika I think has is a kind of like has charisma to spare her too um but yeah she, she 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 takes a chance and who can blame her and and it, it doesn't quite work out sadly yeah, yeah and i'm i, I maybe that's good basically and i i wanted to note like the spirit that i think my heart brought and radhika brought like there's this one like kind of passage that is just kind of talking about the mundane like daily things the joy that she brought to it like when she was on the roof mm. or just doing things that and I loved how, because the scenes with Radhika were some of my favorites when she's like showing up on the bicycle and they're like painting and like she's smoking the cigarettes and there there was this this joy throughout. Um, and so I, I really appreciate that. With both of them, they had such a great spirit. Yeah, they were fun to write actually. Radhika, the, the scenes with Radhika were just um, a joy to write because she's so kind of like, different and modern in her outlook and compared to the other characters and when you've got someone like that who's very much stands in relief against the world around her the world that she's been pitched into it's just fun to write that kind of um um that kind of those kinds of scenes where you just know that it's you know the, the conflict of it just just arises quite quite naturally um, and they, suddenly those scenes just have a certain brightness and a colour because of Radhika because she, as you say, she comes in on her bike and she's, she, she, you know, she's on the roof and she says it how it is and she's also, but she's also deeply charismatic and she's understanding and she's clever and she just has a certain attitude and a bearing, you know, I just, I mean, I love Radhika as, as a character, I think she's, she's great and you're right, that, that spirit and that liveliness is also there in, in Meher. Um, in the 1929 strand and suddenly she brings all this this vivacity and color to this strange dark farm 
and it was really fun to just kind of like build that up and trace that over the over the course of over the course of the novel there's a lot of menace and darkness in in this book but i think of the characters like meher and radhika that kind of give it it's hopefully give give make it bleak in the right way and give give it a kind of a a luster and a shine through just through the sheer force of their their spirit and their characters i hope yeah, and you can understand why the people around them were so drawn to them and loved them. You know, why Jeet felt the affection that he did. Um, so, no, I thought that really did come through. Before I let you go, what are what are you working on now? What are you writing or reading or what should we know about? Oh, I'm, um, I'm just starting making tentative inroads into my next novel. Um, which I'm, I'm just kind of working through. It's a slightly fantastical premise. Um, and again, just parents and children. Um, and I can't, I don't, think I can, I don't think I'm able to say much more than just because I don't think I know much more than that at the moment, Kiki. Um, so yeah, but, but it, it's good to be back into the, in the, in the throes of another, of another work. I always feel just quite happier when I'm, when I've got a novel on the go, it feels it just feels good. And in terms of reading, I've um, I've, I've recently um, finished Tessa Hadley's new novel, Free Love, which is out I think um, early next year, and that's that's wonderful. And it's so attentive for, to life and nuance. Again, doesn't there's just it's got so many. It really pays attention to to the complexity of characters. Actually, there's no good and bad people there's just there's just perspective really which which i think we know and um so i really enjoyed that yeah recommend that heartily okay, i'm excited to read that one well thank you yeah. so much for being here today we really appreciate it and if anyone hasn't read china room yet please do um but sanji thank you so much for being here i really appreciate it i know that was really fun thanks Keith. i'll talk to you later um, and everyone, now we're going to share our next pick. Um, so we will be reading over the course of November and December to give people a little bit extra time and help with the holidays. Um, so but you can get started. You can pick up your copy today. We are reading O. William by Elizabeth Strout. Um, this isn't a finished copy, but the book is out. It just came out. I absolutely adored this book. It is about a woman whose ex-husband uh, finds out a family secret and they decide to go on this adventure together to unravel this family secret. It is about uh, secrets, obviously. Marriage, love, second chances, family. Um, Liz Drought is just absolutely amazing. I can't wait to talk to her. Um, we'll be chatting at the middle of December and we will be updating our Goop Book Club landing page soon. That's goop.com slash goopbookclub. I'm sorry about my tech today. I feel like it was glitchy. I don't know what's going on in my apartment building, but loved chatting with Sanjeev and thank you all for joining and I will hope to see you soon. Okay, bye.